So today we have three of the most beautiful readings in all of Scripture, and they are charged with meaning for us, and they are guideposts to our lives and how our lives should be led. In the first reading, we have the precursor of the greatest event, the greatest sacrifice. Abraham is told to go out with his son Isaac and to go out into the wilderness and make a sacrifice, and he does so. And there he is with his huge knife. Now imagine the largest thing in your kitchen, only really dull. This is not a happy knife. This is for sacrifices. It's as sharp as you could get it back then, but back then they didn't have the ability to get things as sharp as we can today. So here's this jagged, horrible, vicious knife. And how do they build the fire for the sacrifice? Well, they need wood. Wood. And on whose back is the wood strapped? as they make it up to the sacrificial altar in the middle of the desert. His sons, his sons back. Sound familiar? This is the precursor to the crucifixion. And how do I know this? How can you believe Maxim on this one? Because I had to write about a 25 page paper on this second year of seminary, and it was a root canal without anesthetic, let me tell you. Because one of the things you had to do was translate from the Hebrew. That is the precursor, the wood on the back of the sun. Only this time, this time, the sacrifice is not a divine sacrifice. The only similarity is that it is Abraham's only son, just like it was the father's only son who is crucified. And this time, the father says no and stays Abraham's hand. You can imagine the scene as the angel, it's a great painting in the Vatican of this, the angel flying down with his hand mystically around Abraham's, holding back the hand with the knife. Isn't that beautiful? And it is God's mercy. Where do we hear that? God, the Father of mercy. Sound familiar? Those are the first three, four words. I can't count, it's only 10 o'clock. The first four words. God, the Father of... Five words. <laughs> first five words of the prayer of absolution in the confessional. Do you see how Mother Church takes all of these things... Everything connects together. Nothing is in isolation. God, the Father of mercies. And then we go to the second reading. Well, back to the first reading just for a second. Did you notice how he describes the white? The whiteness, okay? And we see that in the gospel too. And then you see in the second reading, if Christ is for us, who can be against us? And when you think of it, that's Christianity. If Christ is for us, if he's on our side, do we give a darn who is against us? No. Because everyone else against Christ is a loser, baby. They always lose. If you're against Christ, you're a loser. So if Christ is on our side, it doesn't matter if we're looking at heart disease or cancer or horror of any kind or dreadful crime or a husband or wife who has made a mistake or anything like that or a child who's giving us trouble. Nothing matters if Christ is on our side. Everything, as we Irish would say, will come up clover, don't you know? Why? Because Christ is on our side. 
That's the beautiful second reading. So encouraging, so hopeful, so reinforcing. And then there's the crescendo for the second week in Lent. The story of the transfiguration. Now, we heard this story in Matthew's version, which is more detailed in Advent. I know all of you never miss Mass. You were all here during Advent, and you all heard this. And by the way, most of you, I can say that's truthful, because I actually look at the congregation when I'm giving a homily, and I know who's here and who's not. So, And good on you. And that beautiful Matthew gospel is so inspiring in Advent. But now we hear the shorter version. Remember, everything from Mark is very short. Mark is the most brief of all the gospels. If you go home today, you can get through the gospel of Mark in 20 minutes. It's not long. It's the shortest of the gospels. Mark preached in Rome. And Romans were about brevity. Get to the point. And so he followed that kind of local habit. So it's the briefest of Gospels, but it includes everything. Now I want you to think of this for a second. Jesus goes up this mountain. How many went on pilgrimage with me? There we go. We were there. We went up to Tabor. We have seen this. And do you remember being there, how close the sky seemed to you? It was, it, was, it was haunting, where you feel like you can almost touch the sky. And you can, just in your mind's eye, you can see the cloud appearing overhead and saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. The Father loving us so much that he's taking us by the collar and shaking us and saying, Hey, idiots, listen to him. I have sent you my only son. You have rejected all of my prophets. You refuse to listen to my word. Listen to him. That's how much God, the Father of mercies, loves us. Look at the analogy of the white. Whiter than any fuller could bleach him. Can you imagine how radiant the transfigured Christ was? And the church teaches that what they were talking about, Elijah representing all the prophets, Moses, wait for it, the canonist is telling you this, Moses representing, I love this part, the law, and finally, Jesus in the middle. They're discussing the church has taught for over 2,000 years, Jesus being crucified. Jesus being crucified. And what happens at the crucifixion? What will you and I celebrate on Good Friday? Well, one, our salvation. But how? Through that sacrifice. For his own son, unlike for Abraham and Isaac, Christ does not send down angels to stay the Roman executioner's hands. Now, This is all beautiful. Thank you, Maxim, for the 10-minute dissertation on Scripture and how it applies. But what does it mean for us? What does it mean for us? The other day, my executive assistant, Janine Jones, sent me to Select Care Hospital. That's the kind of half hospital that used to be St. Joe's. um, And now it's kind of a and I don't mean this as an insult, they work really hard over there. It's kind of a half nursing home. It's for people who are in real trouble and they need more care than you get at a nursing home. So it's kind of half hospital, half nursing home. And anytime we get called over there, probably that person's heading to the elevator. Okay. So I was about to see this wonderful, newly engaged couple. So this couple was pretty cool. I had heard about them. And uh, it was their first visit with me. And I could tell they were kind of nervous. And they're one of these very good-looking couples. 
It's kind of like meeting an intelligent version of Barbie and Ken. <laughs> and they adore each other. You can tell they adore each other, okay? And she's a nurse, and is, as they would say in Boston, wicked smart. And um, he's a really good guy. He's, um, he could have done better in his choice of military services. He's in the United States Chair Force, I mean Air Force. <laughs> and um, so anyway, could have gone Navy. He's, he's a good enough guy to get into the Navy, but he didn't. And you know, everyone's a lot of mistake. But so he, um, they were there in the waiting room. And I, and they, I think they thought they were kind of getting dumped here because I had to run out. And I thought I was going to anoint one man who was dying. So I got to the second floor of select care, and it was a beautiful family. The kids were there, grown kids and their husbands. And there was a lot of tears. And it was clear this man was heading to Christ's arms. And I anointed him and was able to give him the apostolic pardon because he was unconscious. Just so you know what that is, it's a special power given to priests if the person is unconscious and we can't hear their confession. And it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing which absolves not all the ramifications of sin. So that person doesn't go to purgatory. They go into the express elevator. Cool, eh? Yeah. Well, then I go to the, then the nurse grabs me and says, but Father, I'm so sorry, I know you're busy. There's a second man. And so I go into the second man's room. And here, beautiful family. Wife still alive. This guy was in his 90s. Gorgeous, wonderful, wonderful event. People crying, but very happy that he's getting anointed. He gets the apostolic pardon. He's going to the elevator. And then the nurse grabs me as I'm walking down the, the hallway and says, but Father, a third person is now dying. Come up to the fifth floor with me. And so I go to the fifth floor. And this person's family is there. And wife is there. And there's crying and joy and sadness mixed together. And that person is unconscious and gets the apostolic pardon. And a third person is getting on the express elevator for heaven. Now there's two lessons we learned here. First, the transfigured Christ, the divine Christ, that's why he's transfigured, by the way. Unlike Isaac, he's not just a man. He's God, the second person of the Trinity. The transfigured Christ had brought me to that hospital, his priest, his varsity player, so that three of his people could be saved. Now, I want you to think about that today as you go home. I want you to think about how beautiful it is that the Father loves us so much. Now, I could have been anywhere else. I might not have been in the office. I might not have been able to be there for that rock star couple to give them their first lesson, get ready for marriage. So now the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. I go back to the office and there's the rock star couple. There's Barbie and Ken. They're sitting there. And they come in and I meet them. And the first thing I said to them was, I now have a lesson to you of what the end of your marriage will look like. And isn't that true? A husband and wife walk together until one says goodbye. It's beautiful. And the job of each is to get the other to heaven. It's wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I are called by all three wonderful bits of Scripture today to be men and women for others for the greater glory of God. Not to live for ourselves. That should be the theme of your Lent. How can I not live for myself but for others? This week I walked into the office and there were three giant boxes. And I thought, wow, you know, I'm a normal dude typical selfish guy, who sent me a prize? <laughs> this is great. And they were from Washington, D.C., so I couldn't really figure it out. And they were Amazon packages. So this is getting better every second. 
Well, I was in for a little, as the French would say, humilité. Because as I opened each box, they were from an old Navy buddy of mine, a wonderful friend of mine, whose wife just passed away about a year ago. And he's a retired commander like myself, but he is a much more interesting story. He started from seaman recruit, got himself through college during his Navy career, went on to get commissioned, and went from E1 to O5, from seaman recruit to commander. He's what we call a limited duty officer. And he, one of these men, his name is Commander Patrick McCarthy. I call him just Mac. Everyone calls him Mac. One of the guys that mentored me through a 31-year Navy career. And he had sent this parish a couple boxes filled with materials for our warming center. Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. And on it, he simply said to me in a note, Father John, I watch your masses sometimes, and I heard you need help with the warming center. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is someone from outside our parish in Washington, D.C., a man for others for the greater glory of God. Each of us are called to be that. That's how you live today's gospel. That's how you recognize the transfigured Christ, and you say, please, Master, dwell with me. Lent is a time of contemplation, thoughtfulness, regret, seeking forgiveness, and then moving forward. Moving forward to realize that through the gift of the cross and the wonderment of the resurrection, no problem in our life is too big as long as next to us at our side is Jesus the Christ, the transfigured one, the one so white in his clothes no wooler on earth could bleach it to be like that. The cleanliness of perfection, the cleanliness of forgiveness, the cleanliness for you and I of eternal life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.